Good morning, everyone. Just uh, one or two more minutes while we set up the PowerPoints and then we'll get started. Hi again. Thank you for your patience. It seems like we got everything sorted. Um, and welcome to the session, Let People Speak, Using Evidence from the Global South to Reshape Our Digital Future. This is a nice, uh, cozy little group. It's too bad we can't sort of all come together and sit around in a circle, but uh, that's fine. It is what it is. So I'm Matthew Smith, uh, your uh, last minute uh, substitution moderator. Uh, and if anyone watches TV, I'm not that Matt Smith. I'm another uh, Matt Smith. And I work at Canada's International Development Research um, Center. And I'm not going to, we've lost a little time, and I'm not really going to get into a big introduction. But I'll suffice it to say that we've been proud to support uh, this work that's going to be talked about today. 
Um, today, we have panelists and uh, discussants. I'm going to really quickly introduce them, and then we're going to get right to it. So where is Allison? Allison Gilwald from Research ICT Africa, University of Cape Town. Helani Galpaya from Learn Asia. Eileen Aguero, Dirsi. And for discussants, we've got Daniel Abadi from uh, Argentina, the, the Digital Government Office, the Ministry of Modernization, which I look forward to hearing more about. Adil Suleiman from the Information Society Division, the African Union Commission, sitting uh, amongst you. And Henriette Esterhausen from APC next to him, and Scarlett Fondure uh, to my right at UNCTAD, the Partnership on Measuring ICT for Development. We also have uh, Enrique, where is he? Up oh, over there, doing uh, as a rapporteur, and Chennai Chair as our online moderator who might uh, feed us some questions from uh, our friends on the interwebs. Okay, so um, to start everything off, I'm going to turn to Allison for her presentation. Yeah, but I might actually have to. You can see it there. Oh, there it is. Um, welcome, firstly, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. I think on the sort of last session of the last day, um, I'm sure everybody's really tired and ready to go home. Um, this uh, survey that we, uh, the data that we're going to show you. Um, brings together um, studies, uh, demand-side studies done across the global south, um, 16 countries all in all, um, that is still in progress, and we're hoping to do a number of further studies. Um, we have got uh, some studies are still kind of in the field in Asia, or being wrapped up from the field in Asia, and we are doing, we're very pleased to be excited to be doing another two countries in Africa with the support of CEDA, and um, uh, one country in Latin America and Asia as well. That will take us very close to 20, I think, which is back to where we sort of were just for Africa a few years ago, but it's, it's very exciting to get that back. All of these regions have been doing um, demand-side data, uh, demand-side surveys um, for over a decade, um, but this is the first time we've actually used the same instrument to do nationally representative surveys. Um, these are really important because there's, in our prepaid mobile markets, there is no other way to get the actual numbers of people who are connected, who they are, and what they're using the internet for. In a prepaid mobile market, you simply cannot um, identify the gender of the user of that SIM card, or you know how are they, what they're doing on the internet as a woman. You can see who they are, where the SIM card's going, but you can't see it. It's very simple things like the connectivity figures that we have such diverse um, data on, from you know GSMA or ITU, and then our data from the Global South is really only possible because you can identify the actual unique user of a SIM in this case, or user of, um, of the internet. Um, by identifying the number of duplicate SIM cards that there are, um, that the individual is using or you know, aggregated across the nation. And even in, uh, as we move to uh, more competitive environments and if we move into the internet, we're still finding very high numbers of duplicate SIM cards in many countries. It used to be very, very high with mobile phone, just for mobile phone usage, but now it still tends to be pretty high. So this data is really um, important uh, in terms of that. And, um, yeah, so it's, a, it's also the data is really focused on the after access, moving beyond um, the simple connectivity issues, looking at the challenges of um, moving to data environments, um, OTTs, et cetera, that are challenging us, um, the adoption and substitution of voice and text services. But far more importantly than that, looking at the factors of inequality um, that affect you, the use of the internet once one's even connected or prevent one from being connected. Um, so that's the really important contribution as well. well. Who isn't using the net or why aren't they using it optimally? So um, if we could just click on the slides a little bit. Um, I'm not going to say very much about the methodology unless people would like to come back to it, in which case I think Eileen will probably best handle um, questions on that. But basically, the, the um, survey um, is nationally representative. It has a 95% um, uh, uh, error, error confidence uh, measure. And um, essentially, we work off the national census frame. We sample from the national census frame um, at the household level. We then um, randomly select an individual from the household, so we get both household individual data as well. And then the um, um, sample is weighted, or the data is weighted once we get it um, according to um, uh, 
various methodologies that have allowed us to um, use relatively small samples with high levels of um, accuracy and to also um, get data from predominantly urban areas where we get data, um, but also cover rural areas but weighted accordingly um, at the national level. So um, if we could just move on from that slide very quickly. Um, We've just got a couple of slides. We don't claim for these um, studies to be regionally representative because we don't do enough countries in these studies, but I think they are indicative of what's happening in the region. Um, and I think if you just look here at um, Africa, you can see uh, that we have very high mobile phone access from Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, our lowest in the least developed countries, of course, Mozambique, um, Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, um, all considerably lower. But you can see our higher, um, higher penetration countries looking more like Latin America and our low ones way below Asia. So, um, yeah, I mean, the Latin American is an interesting comparison for a country like South mm -hmm. Africa. Yeah, the thing is that um, in Latin America, um, mobile ownership is not uh, an issue now as compared to what it was like 10 years ago when we were doing this kind of research. And um, that's why... Um, Maybe, as Alison said, um, Latin American countries will be more similar to South Africa um, in those terms. But maybe we will have a look later at smart. Well, see, I think there are some slides later. It's basically that, you know, uh, phone access is quite high, but the problem is that they're feature phones. And the thing here is that, you know, India has over 1.2 billion people. So if you think about Asia, you know, all of Asia is, you know, sort of South Asia is pretty much wiped out by the India numbers. So if you want to get a sense of what's happening in South Asia, just look at the uh, India numbers because that will be the weighted number. It will be very close to what India is. So next. Next slide. Internet. Yeah, I mean, internet use um, is abysmal, let's just put it that way, you know. Um, you know, under 20%, India around 19%, uh, Bangladesh around 13%, Cambodia is the only high number. Cambodia, interestingly, in Southeast Asia is very similar to the Myanmar numbers we have seen, which are not shown, which is, again, in the high 30s as a percentage of the population. Uh, newly entered into the market, but uh, abysmal in India for a country that has, you know, reformed its sector 16 years and going now. Yeah, and I think if you look at the um, Africa data, again, we've got this enormous diversity between the different regions. Again, South Africa looking more like, well, they're still below Latin America, interestingly. Um, but then these least developed countries um, having really, really um, poor outcomes. So the slides of where I can see Adil staring at the screen desperately. Um, but basically, we've got Rwanda, 8%. Yeah, we've got Mozambique, 10%, and Tanzania, 14%. Um, so we're not even reaching these um, theoretical, you know, 20% critical masses in order to get these positive network effects, you know, associated with, with, with the digital economy. And also interesting because, you know, so much effort has been made to um, uh, address the issues of connectivity. I mean, particularly Rwanda. Rwanda's had, you know, um, sort of you know, World Bank money poured into it, um, you know, WEF projects associated with it. And yet they um, looking, you look at it and you see that you've got such so little penetration, which I think is, again, just emphasizing the um, demand side constraints on this, the skills, the affordability issues that are still affecting Internet take up. Are we talking about fixed line or mobile? Yeah, um, internet. Basically, internet use is both, but uh, across most of these countries, it's 99% mobile. Yeah. Very, very little fixed outside of South Africa and North Africa, but the North Africa figures aren't even here. Mm -hmm. And from Latin America, I just wanted to point out that when we were thinking of which countries to choose uh, to do in the surveys, we thought about having one uh, with high income levels, middle income levels, and a little bit low uh, income levels. So all the results that we, that we will see uh, will more or less reflect that ranking, because uh, Argentina is always on top, then Peru and Colombia, with middle income, 
and Guatemala and Paraguay are at the bottom. No? And this, this is the same uh, as we are seeing here in the case of internet use. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Oh, okay. It, it just um, perhaps just if we could go to the next slide on the average internet years of use. That's um, got we've got some Latin American and African data on. Um, yeah. As again, as I mentioned I mentioned before, uh, in Argentina we find um, users with more experience in terms of internet. No, and then um, Guatemala and Paraguay at the other extreme. This is important as um, we've been listening in these uh, sessions uh, through all these days, that for example, in terms of cybersecurity, um, there are more threats to more recent users. So uh, we could say that these countries with, that has less experience uh, in internet use are more, um, th there is more uh, danger in terms of what they can do, uh, what uh, websites they can access, or anything like that. So um, this is something we will discuss maybe uh, later. No? Yeah, I think for, for South Africa as well, um, you know, in South Africa, um, a few of the countries had initial take up with PCs, but it was really around 2010, 2012 that we saw the massive uptake of a mobile internet or the internet because of the access to mobile, mobile um, broadband. Um, that's led to the uptake of internet. And so again, we've got people with um, the poorer countries with much lower, you know, less experience, um, and probably the group, same group when we look at the data um, more deeply that we're going to see are unable to use the internet as optimally as um, people who've been online longer, or are using devices um, and, and uh, software and stuff that's only really feasible to use on a, on a um, PC. Yeah, the next slide. Internet for work. So I think this is a, an interesting slide. We've actually uh, got a whole set of questions on, on micro work, or not a whole set of questions, but it's some very interesting questions on micro work that provide some of the first demand side data on um, rep nationally representative demand side data on what is happening in, in, in the area of micro work. Particularly in Africa, there's been work done by Learn Asia. Um, and DOSI um, in, on, on micro work and on digital platforms um, for some time, but this is the really first demand side data. Most of that is looked at mainly at from the platform side as the supply side. And I just, I think the point for Africa is that the use of micro work is extremely limited and really, um, you know, puts serious questions around the hype of um, micro work being able to provide, you know, provide a solution to, to structural unemployment across the continent. Obviously, the figures are so low for micro work when your internet penetration is only seven or eight or 10 or 13 percent, then the fact that you've only got, you know, four, five, seven percent of people doing micro work is not surprising. Makes sense. Um, so this 10 percent of internet users number is actually a really large number when you look at it from another side, you know, who, have, who do micro work. So if you actually look at micro work platforms, uh, India is the second largest provider of labor in, in micro work outside of the US. And the US has, you know, Amazon, Mechanical Turk, that kind of work. Uh, but if you take the top four platforms, freelancer.com, Upwork, etc., cetera, uh, India is the largest provider and yet it's only about 10% of the total population between the ages of 15 to 60, uh, 65. I think that's the more interesting thing. Um, and Bangladesh is trying very hard right now with international donor money to actually roll out micro work, you know, training people to work online, you know, uh, doing digital work, l doing logos, doing websites and so on. So we'll see, but basically these are small blips at the moment. Again, in Latin America, this uh, area of using the internet for work is not that much, um, has not developed that much. Um, basically, there's, um, uh, the internet is used for, um, I don't know, taxis, or maybe some kind of translations, um, but there's no, not so much uh, of experience in this area. I think that even there, are, there were some issues in terms of how to regulate these activities. Maybe Daniel can comment us later um, about this 
uh, taxi ap applications. No, I think there were restrictions in Argentina to, to this. Do you want me to, 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 to talk now? Do you want me sure. to talk later? Uh, sure. Sure, okay. Well, first of all, hi all. Uh, there were some restrictions in the previous administration. Uh, actually, this change in the last two years. We had, this year we passed a, a law for SMEs and for entrepreneurs to create in their own company in the first 24 hours. Uh, Argentina blooming technology is seen, is, is getting bigger. If you see Latin America, digital economy ecosystem, the four unicorns, the four companies value over a billion dollars are from Argentina. And for us, taking the office two years ago is a great challenge looking that four companies grow up in Argentina, although all the challenges and blockings government was giving them. So now we're trying to stimulate SMEs and entrepreneurs. There's a lot of work outsourced from Argentina because we are in the same time zone like New York, so maybe a huge Indian company like Tata is outsourcing in Argentina from India. So that we are, we are building that mix. Um, if you think about Latin America, 62% of the homes in Argentina has access to the broadband. There's a mobile penetration of 98%, but we only had, we have 44 million people and only 27 million people uses internet. So we think what's, what's how we, can we fill that gap between people? We were not growing internet users, so something more besides infrastructure is happening. Okay, the next slide. Okay. I mean, I'll just say that in Asia, you might as well look at social media numbers or look at internet numbers. They're basically na this, exactly the same, like plus minus 1%. Social media is the killer app. Uh, in all the countries we work in, these are just three of them. And um, yeah, for example, in Cambodia, it even might be higher than the internet number in East, uh, Southeast Asia. And social media includes sort of Facebook, Facebook Messenger, anything where you can basically broadcast, including Twitter, um, uh, WhatsApp, as long as you're using it for broadcasting, so it was quite broadly defined. In Latin America, like, well, the figures are there. Uh, if you can't uh, see them, well, we have the highest levels in, uh, of social media use in Colombia and Argentina. And then Paraguay is uh, um, the, the country with the with lowest um, percentage of social media use. Uh, what we found, uh, we found something interesting while doing the field work, um, and it was that when we were asking people if they use social media, like Facebook, whatever, they said yes. No, but when we asked them if they use the internet, they said like, no, but they were not aware of the fact that social media <laughs> works through the internet. That's why on the questionnaire we had to make distinctions about this to see what really people understand by this new concept. Can I just ask a question for clarification? Is that the percentage of the population that uses social media or the percentage of people that have internet access? No, 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 it's just the percentage of the population. The population. That, this is why we, like, we didn't put a filter. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry, please. Just real quick also on social media use, was there any question around frequency that was factored in here? Yes. Okay. Not, I don't think we're showing it, but no, we're not uh, showing I'm showing it for Asia, but yeah, I, I, there was lots of questions about frequency. Yeah, and so it's, it's a massive data set and there are lots of questions around um, frequency of different um, things that you do on the internet. So um, there's certainly a lot of um, granularity we've got there. Um, just to say, you know, again, um, South Africa, you know, 42% of people actually um, using social media, um, much higher than Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya that follow just below 30%. And um, even South Africa at 42 is way below your lowest levels in Latin America. So, I th yeah, I think it's an interesting question around, because if we actually overlay these with prices, which we haven't really done here, but we actually see Asia's prices are extremely low. Um, a lot of these African countries, for example, Tanzania, Mozambique, these poorest countries here, and in fact, Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya, in fact, all the middle section, all have very good prices, have, have very low prices. Um, so, and Latin America has these very high prices, but obviously you've got you know, greater discretionary income and high GDP per capita and various things, but it's, it's really reflected here that many of these countries are extremely um, poor. And 
you know, arguably may never be able to afford to use the internet at the kind of, you know, optimally at the um, amount of bandwidth, et cetera, that we need, as long as we continue to use, you know, purely commercial um, sort of GSM models. Thanks, Lai. Um, this is just, I'm not going to go into detail on this because you certainly can't see it from your slide, but when we post this on the, on the, on the website, um, it's just got the um, sample sizes for the various countries, their populations, of course, it's percentage of their population size, um, the breakdowns for urban and rural and female and male, um, which the next slides look at a little bit more, little bit more detail. I think the next one is mobile penetration by gender in Africa. I'm just going to go very quickly through these because we're now really out of time. Um, but just to look at where we're seeing these biggest um, disparities. And, um, you know, there's obviously a, a, a reasonably concerning gap between, uh, in Ghana between men and women. But the really interesting, very, very big gaps is actually in these poorer countries. So we see a very big gap in Rwanda. You know, 60% of men, 37% as opposed to 37% of women, um, and in Mozambique, 50% of women, uh, so men, and 32% of women. Um, and this really supports our um, earlier modeling in, on earlier rounds of research that show that there is actually not a big gender divide in and um, between men and women of a similar income. There are some nuances once we look at the internet, but in fact, the, the drivers of inequality are education and income, and women are concentrated in, at the bottom of the pyramid, not receiving education and income. So that's really where our policy attention needs to go. Um, just smartphone by penetration, um, you've got an interesting, um, you know, bigger gap there with men and women in South Africa. Um, these bigger um, uh, gaps, in the, uh, sorry, smaller gaps than you saw um, in the internet overall, because basically, again, to support the idea that it's income and education driven, or income driven, particularly in this case, is men and women of a similar income who could afford a smartphone are the people who are accessing this first, you know, quarter of 50, half, half of the um, people with, the, with, with cell phones. Um, if we look at um, internet use by um, gender, as I said, there you see that really big gap in Rwanda. Um, very interesting, very close in, in, in Kenya. Sorry for the blue slip there, but that's um, uh, men and women. The, the, the male is the, um, sorry, this index, index down here hasn't changed properly, but if you look at it, the male is the red bar and the female is the um, blue bar, uh, the black bar. If we go um, social media, we can again see in countries where we're getting higher penetration, where there's um, similar income between men and women, um, we're getting quite similar uses of social media where we've got bigger inequities, um, we've got differences. Interestingly, um, Nigeria's got a big gap between men and women on, on, on social media, which we need to look at a little bit more closely um, because they've got this very dynamic content industry and you know, they've obviously got um, large, large numbers of women in the workforce, but they still have a very rural, um, uh, predominantly rural um, uh, um, population, so that might be explained by that. Um, just for work, you know, do you, are you using the internet for work related by gender? Um, we see predominantly men are using it for, for work. We also see predominantly rural yeah. people are using it in some environments. And then we see um, in Nigeria, we've actually got more women. So again, these are things that we'll be able to look at when we look more closely at those country studies. And ag again, by location, we do see um, in more urbanized countries, less of a divide between urban and, and, and rural. Um, we see in um, Tanzania big, a big gap between the two, Nigeria less so, Rwanda quite a big gap between urban rural, and Mozambique a big gap between urban rural. And these are um, some of these countries, the least developed countries are countries that are still struggling to get the kind of coverage that is, poss is available in many of the other countries on the continent. And then just smartphone by location, very clearly urban populations with access to smartphones and rural populations are unable to access smartphones. Um, this is urban rural um, for internet. Um, yeah, the education I'm going to leave because it requires a bit of more of a, a discussion there. Um, I think this is the, the rural one that's actually been duplicated. So I'm going to go on to uh, just sorry, one quick point about the, the micro work um, in Africa because we haven't done the. Um, uh, we're not going to have much time for discussion on this, but there is, as I said, a whole slide. Um, a whole data set on this, um, but we see these very, very low levels of, of, of micro work um, in Ghana. For example, um, only 2% 2 uh, 2 of women, whereas you've got 50, of the people who are doing micro work, only 2% are women, whereas you've got 55% um, of, of, of that 
sorry, and 55% of that is, is ma uh, male. Um, again, Kenya, very low, three. Mozambique, Spice. a little bit higher. Nigeria, um, around 10%. Uh, Rwanda, only 3%, uh, nearly 4% of people who are doing micro work, of that very small number of people who are on the internet, um, and 77% of them are, are, are men. So in, Ra in Rwanda, across all of these measures, we've got really high um, discrepancies between men and women. Um, I'm going to leave it there. We're definitely out of time. Um, social media, we've discussed. Just some quickly, very quickly, some limitations to use. And I, we need to look at this in two different countries, and the slide is just far too, too busy. But interestingly, and this Ghana at the bottom in the red, and um, Ghana had the biggest, large, one, some of the these, you know, large numbers of people who said that basically don't have limitations. Um, whereas if you, um, so, um, so the next one is Kenya, also 16% people who said they actually don't have limitations, 19% um, in Nigeria, 21% in South Africa. But if we look at the cost of data, we actually see that um, uh, Although we, we identify Ghana, um, Ghana as having quite good prices, it's still a, a barrier for large numbers of people. The prices are still just too high for, for a lot of people. Um, interestingly, for Rwanda, that's a, the, one of the big things is la a lack of content in my language. So, you know, people are, it's a very rural population, um, and as I said, very low um, GDP per capita, et cetera, and people really struggling to find the internet um, meaningful or being able to use the internet. Interestingly, um, uh, they also, they, interestingly, because they seem so um, offline, is that they had one of the highest levels of concern about using the internet around malware and certain things like that. So whether there's actually you know, an awareness that is keeping them off the internet or not is something that would require um, further investigation. Um, but still large numbers of people who find it difficult to use. As I said, Rwanda, again, a lot of people who are just un unable to use it. And um, I'm going to leave it there. We require sort of a lot more um, discussion on that to get, pick up some of those granularities and go on to Asia. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we know the countries. The Pakistan data, unfortunately, is not being shown because it's so fresh. The last bits came in last Friday. So uh, it will be integrated, as will last year's Myanmar survey data. So I will just talk about uh, the sort of the Bangladesh, um, India, and Cambodia. The four countries that we studied is 23% of the world's population and sadly 36% of the world's poor. So solving India's problems, our India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan would really help in this whole region. Next slide, please. So sample sizes are you know, 5,000 for India, 2,000 each for the other countries. Next slide. Uh, so when it comes to mobile phone ownership, uh, we're doing quite well in the mid-90s or above the mid-90s, even in rural areas. So, um, you know, people have had mobile phones. Liberalization started, you know, back in 1996-ish. Um, so it's had a long track record. Please, next. Uh, at the household level, so when you ask, do you have a working internet connection of any type, uh, there you can see the red is the total number. It's quite low uh, at household level, meaning you can share somebody else's also. Um, Cambodia, 5%. India, 21%. Bangladesh, you know, um, 11%. There is obviously a big urban-rural gap that you see. Uh, the dark gray bar being urban and the other one in rural. Next. So what is this internet connection at household level? All, all countries, uh, pretty much, uh, there's hardly any um, fixed ADSL, CDMA, other forms. It's mostly mobile. The exception is Cambodia, which interestingly has other technologies other than mobile coming into the household. Next. Uh, access usage and ownership shows the pattern you would expect, which is access is high, as we said, for mobile, because you do share phones as well. That's the lightest color. Uh, usage for voice and data or any kind of usage, and this is really all voice when we're talking about use, the middle bar is lower than ac you know, access, but you do use it quite well. Ownership is lower, obviously, of a device that you can call your own. Next. Uh, 
so this is the total mobile phone ownership. I think we've seen these numbers before. There is an urban-rural divide, uh, in a significantly big in Cambodia and India, close to 30%. Next. When it comes to gender, again, we see a gender gap. It's about 34% in Bangladesh for mobile phone ownership. Somehow not here in this graph. And in the other two countries, you know, 20 and 46%. 46% in India, that's, you know, that's half as likely to have a phone than a man. That's a huge gap. Next. Type of mobile owned, it's mostly the basic phones. Uh, and then you've got the feature phones, which are the internet-enabled phones, but not touchscreen fancy smartphones, and lower penetration of smartphones, except, again, Cambodia, which is very interesting, um, has high uh, penetration of smartphones. India uh, sees this sort of generational shift where most people had the very basic keypad phones, then they skipped the other slightly better feature phones, which are internet-enabled, but uh, to small screen and are jumping straight on to the affordable smartphones, many which are manufactured in India for very affordable prices for people. Next. Uh, and, you know, owning your own device is one of the biggest barriers because the internet experience, especially using something like where you need to sign in, like Facebook, is a personal experience. People are not very willing to take somebody else's phone, log in with usernames into Facebook whereas people are quite willing to take somebody else's phone and make calls. So sharing behavior is low um, when it comes to internet, and no need for a phone is one of the reasons that they give for not actually owning their own phone. And the second, obviously, is I can't afford it. Some also in these graphs um, say that I actually don't need it, and that's a big, much bigger problem, harder problem to solve where people don't see the need. Next. Internet access, uh, you've um, sort of, let's actually skip this. We've talked about low internet access. Let's just look at urban-rural divides. Again, we are reaching the 40% kind of divide between urban areas and rural areas. In India, it's close to 50%. Next. Uh, male, female, again, for internet access. Now, before we showed for phone ownership, 60% in India, extremely high. Uh, and 34% or in, even in uh, Bangladesh, 52%. Next. Uh, and this is one of the big problems. People actually don't know what the internet is. So when we ask them, are you aware, do you know what the internet is? And we define it sort of rather broadly to include anything from browser use to uh, using maps to using Facebook to WhatsApp, Viber, et cetera, in this broad definition, uh, the number of people who say yes is what's shown here and it's broken up by urban and rural. So in India, about 35% of the people know what the internet is. They've heard of it, which means all the rest, 65%, actually do not know. They, they take no. Uh, similarly, in Cambodia and then again Bangladesh, about 70% of the people don't know about it. Next. Awareness of the internet by men versus women. Again, there's a gap in awareness. 40% uh, in India, around 30% in the other two countries. Next. Uh, first time internet use is mobile, which is why I kept saying that, you know, getting a good functioning mobile, a smartphone into the hands of people is essential. Uh, desktops are used in India, and I mean, I, we should break this down, but I suspect this will be people who work outside at a job that requires a desktop, not people who have their, you know, have it necessarily at home. Next. Uh, we can skip this. Okay. When using the internet, most of the time is spent on social media, as I said. Social media is the killer app. Um, uh, and when we ask them, this is shown in the data, social media, and then entertainment. And chatting. Chatting means the WhatsApp and Viber chats, the text SMS. Next. Uh, we actually have a whole module on social media and behavior. Who are your friends? How do you accept friends? Did you unfriend anybody? Why? Etc. So just to give one thing, you know, what, are the, what is the information that you share? on social media is something we ask. Like, can others see this information, like gender, like age, you know, a marital status, religion. And this becomes important in what kind of internet experience people have when they do get online. And we see this in Cambodia. There's, they continuously share less 
to the public on social media about gender, about religion, about age. Whereas in South Asia, they say that, you know, they are much more willing to, certainly more than Cambodia. Next. Uh, just on the phone, SMS is frequently used, calls, chatting, staying in touch. This is very similar to what the patterns we have seen um, across Asia in the pre previous surveys. Next. Uh, and then there's a whole set of questions around capacity. Are they actually able to use the phone? Are they able to change the settings? Are they, and so on. So just to highlight one is that uh, most, uh, when they need help, they get it from friends or family. So it's not that they go to the internet and find things or ask others. Friends and family are the first line of technical support when you can't uh, uh, jiggle with your phone. Next. Uh, I think, oh, then we had a specific question about apps for people who could actually install apps. So as a percentage of smartphone owners, uh, can you install apps and what kind of apps? Obviously not surprising, we see social media and messaging and entertainment apps as the most downloadable and in, uh, installed and used. Next. Uh, mobile banking is another module. I just wanted to highlight that in all the three regions, these modules in the questionnaire. And mobile banking uh, is heavily used in Bangladesh. And, you know, that's the dark, uh, dark, sort of blackish 33% all the way on the left-hand side, but again, low penetration and much needed because this is a hugely unbanked population. Um, so long way to go. Next. And then we asked, do you know about all these platforms everyone goes on about, you know, in the gig economy? Do you know about um, uh, sort of residential stuff like Airbnb, about taxis, about working, about buying and selling like Amazon and so on? Uh, this is the awareness and India obviously has not too bad, like about 50% of the people know about transport, gig economy, work, lower awareness in the other countries. Next. And uh, actual usage, again, India has a thriving e-commerce market locally through Flipkart. That's why you see the actual use pretty high in India, very low in the other countries. Reason for not owning, uh, using the internet Excuse me. is Sorry? lack of understanding what the internet is and knowing how can to I, use it. Can I just throw in one question because this would be very interesting uh, for me. Uh, is there any um, awareness of cross-border um, gig economy um, activity? So, uh, would, because this is a topic that ha has come up uh, quite yes. often also at IGF. Do you have any data in that uh, We in can't that differentiate regard? between cross-border versus in-country because the questionnaire is when it's localized includes cross-border and in-country apps, so Airbnb and something that's particularly used, let's say, in Myanmar. So, we, uh, you know, that's in the description, so you can't break that out. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll actually stop there. I mean, we've addressed the uh, problems, you know, uh, lack of understanding. Anyway, uh, so main reason for not using the Internet more than they currently use. So then we asked the people who are using now, would you use it more and why don't you use it more? Uh, sort of huge variation by country. Interestingly, in Cambodia, this big gray, light gray area is speed. Um, so we did a whole lot of testing. We sent the mobile phone, the, the enumerators to the field with phones, which actually tested. So that's about 20,000 data, 24,000 data points for India, which we analyzed. We haven't analyzed it for the other countries. So we'll get a sense of whether this is perception or whether this is actually shown in the data for the speed test. And Africa, uh, and Africa as well did that, right? Yeah, so that'll be another whole set. Uh, anyway, thank you. Yes, yeah, so now I will show um, some data for Latin America. Um, I'll just skip this. As, as I said, um, uh, mobile phone ownership is not that much of an issue. Can you pass? Yes. Um, in, ter in terms of smartphone penetration in, in our countries, uh, especially in the country where, where I come from, Peru, uh, the urban-rural gap is quite high, as you can see, and the same happens in Paraguay. In the rest of the countries, uh, there is much more, uh, it's much more equal. Um, yeah, can you click, please, Chennai? 
Can you keep? No, no, it's okay. No, no, go away. <laughs> yeah, uh, here I wanted to show what we have called uh, mobile usage, traditional versus no, non-traditional. Um, we, have, we have in the questionnaire uh, uh, more or less nine uh, traditional mobile uses, which are um, making and receiving calls, uh, sending and receiving SMS, taking picture, pictures, etc. And we've called um, non-traditional mobile uses um, the use of applications, mobile applications. So what we can see here is that, uh, especially in rural areas of Colombia, uh, Guatemala, um, Paraguay, the difference between these uh, more traditional uses and non-traditional uh, mobile uses are much higher. Also, um, in terms of uh, traditional uses, it's like we can see uh, uh, the, the, the levels of, of these uses are more equal, but uh, there's a lot of variations between um, uh, non-traditional uh, mobile uses. Uh, and we were, we were also curious about what was uh, the main reason for not owning a smartphone. And uh, something has changed um, when we compare these results to uh, the previous re research that we did some years ago. And uh, uh, we find that, for example, in Paraguay and in Guatemala, the main reason is that the, the respondents do not need one. And, um, for example, in my country, uh, affordability is still an issue because 30% of the respondents said that, well, no, this was uh, still a problem for them. And in the rest of the countries, um, the, the issue of not needing one and the affordability one are almost the same. Um, as we have already talked about education and work, I just wanted to focus in this graph uh, in the um, government-related activities online. No, um, so I, I've heard uh, in, the, in the different panels that we've uh, been through these days uh, that there are many e-government strategies, plans, digital agendas, and everything. And when I see at these results, I, <laughs> I started to question uh, what's going on, actually. No? As there are, uh, as only in Argentina, these activities are close to 25 percent while in uh, Colombia, Guatemala, and Peru, it, they represent less than 20%. So maybe we will have to look deeper into what's happening. And again, Daniel will explain us what he's been doing in Argentina to try to address this problem. Um, yeah. And again, I wanted to show here uh, what was the main reason for not using the internet. No? And uh, uh, we have different results. For example, in Peru, uh, there is no interest. For 50% <laughs> of the respondents, they are not interested in the internet. And while in Argentina, uh, the, main, um, the main reason is that, um, um, yeah, th again, there is no interest. Huh? Uh, and yes, we will have to, uh, Listen to Daniel, maybe you can tell us uh, already what you've been working on, okay. uh, all the trainings that you are doing, uh, you're organizing throughout your country. Okay. Maybe. I can, mm -hmm. I can go through that. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, about government services in Argentina. Yes, it's true, uh, beside, uh, beside the national level, Argentina, we got 2,000 local governments. When, when we took the office two years ago, at least 1,000 didn't got internet connection access in their home. Uh, town halls, so we are working with local governments to bring services to the digital and to this century. Uh, in that side, when we go forward as a government making all things digital, what we also are creating is a digital gap between citizens that don't access to the internet. And if we are getting digital services online, basically we are just excluding them so what we did, we, we created a national inclusion plan working digital literacy, working with, you know, Argentina. As you all know, Argentina, we got 30% of our citizens are in poverty. So we believe internet is one of those tools we can give them to progress and to build a better future. So we are working with vulnerable uh, people, basically teaching them how to use the internet, not also literacy, but also how to do services online, how to learn how to apply for a job, how to get or use an email. It's extremely true what Eileen said. There's a disconnection between 
the what is internet and the access to Facebook or WhatsApp. Even when we ask, you get internet. The, the, the obviously answer is not, but the answer about Facebook is, is yes. It's I know it's a generation it's a generational thing. You know, internet has become a community. Most of us has already in our part of our life we connected to the internet. Nowadays, no one connects to the internet. It's just it works. So that gets a dissociation between the, the, the concept of using you know, social, social networks and using internet as a productive thing. We're working on that. We're working with parents about teaching them how to accompany their children through the internet process, you know, the, the challenges and the, and the, and the, uh, between surfing the net. Um, so we had set a plan trying to impact a million people each year about getting them online. We believe there's about 10 million people in Argentina that they don't use internet and we split connectivity to access, you know. One, one thing is infrastructure that we're working on, but also creating digital skills based on the internet to progress and to get, you know, jobs and development. So it's good to hear that there is some work uh, from the government in getting to know uh, the reality of the users, of the, um, of the citizens. Um, and much and many things can be done if we look at this, for example, this kind of evidence, no? what, like to know what is the main reason or the main barriers um, that prevent people from using the internet, mobile phones or whatever. And the good news is that we have all these set of questions for, for the three regions. No? Can we continue? <laughs> then again, we have uh, social media data. Um, and once again, there is a huge difference uh, between urban and rural, rural areas in Peru and also in Paraguay. Okay. Um, and well, the rest, uh, we wanted to show also some uh, gaps between males and females. And, uh, but I will just leave it there maybe because uh, the results are almost the same as uh, <laughs> It's again in Peru, in Paraguay, and in Guatemala where we find um, uh, more, more differences. And in the rest of the countries, uh, we don't have much problems. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. So this is, a, this is a nice small group. So actually, instead of doing something real formal and, and opening up to the floor, I think it's good to just raise your hand, click the little red button, and ask your question. <coughs> um, so actually, I would like to just put it out there if there are any questions specifically on findings and methodology. Is that, please? Thank you for this uh, very informative presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, as a continental organization, the African Union Commission, I would like to see uh, statistics for the entire continent. I know that there is work underway <laughs> uh, to include other countries. Um, uh, I have three questions actually. One on the methodology. Maybe I missed that part. Uh, was it done through a telephone interview or I wasn't sure about the methodology, if you can shed more light on that. And on the findings, uh, was there any effort to cross-check the finding with the existing data by other institutions and then if there's variance and uh, any explanation why they are the results are different from existing findings by other institutions. Uh, my last question is, uh, do you have a plan to, uh, to have this survey as like one-stop shop for all ICT-related parameters uh, in so that, you know, we just go to your survey and then we find everything to do with ICT and we don't have to leverage other institutions to get uh, the data? Thank you. Uh, yes, regarding the methodology, uh, all the, the enumerator, enumerators sorry, were there on the field. And uh, before, we, do, we did many trainings in each country, in each of the countries. And uh, we used also in the majority of, con of, co of countries uh, tablets so that we could register the information there. In Latin America specifically, we couldn't do this in Guatemala and Paraguay because of the technical limitations, but in the rest of the countries, um, we, we traveled, we did the trainings and the numerators were there on the field and uh, more or less um, in our case, um, the, um, the survey lasted uh, one hour. 
approximately, in some cases less, even half an hour. So it's not a telephone interview, mm -hmm, it's a face-to-face mm -hmm. -face visit to the house, mm -hmm. randomly selected, and then go back to the house to, to interview the randomly selected individual. Mm -hmm. And we had some replacement rules in case um, the selected respondents were not there, etc. So there is, a, there is a very rigorous methodology to ensure that you get the um, country, the, the households and the individuals, et cetera, that are sampled and you have to, you have to go back, et cetera. What I wanted to um, speak about a little bit more was the um, complementary aspects of this data in relation to other uh, data sets and data collection. Um, and then also um, possibly that, as I said before, this actually this is the only way you can get this data and it doesn't actually exist anywhere else. But just um, quickly to speak about the complementary nature of it, if we are able to bring together, um, you know, a few critical questions into the national census, so every five years or even longer in some countries' cases, we've got a, at least a set of, you know, uh, critical questions, um, five or ten if we could squeeze that many out of the national census, on ICTs, these could be used as like verification points um, in, you know, that, that we can then do much deeper um, in-depth surveys in between. So that obviously we're only doing these relatively small samples, yeah. we're only nationally representative, whereas these other um, you know, census like household surveys, even if it was the annual survey, we could get five or so questions in. We could use these in between these far bigger um, surveys, which are of course extremely expensive to do, and on average in our case take about an hour, an hour and a quarter to do. Um, also, there's um, translation into local languages and stuff, and a bit of to and fro, so that can also make it a bit longer. But act, act, what is important for us is to try and get some coordination, and that's why we work very closely with the ITU and UNCTAD and um, our national um, census offices where we can, to try and um, use this the, the, the data in a complementary way for you know, uh, supplementing um, the, the research that is out there, but also for verification for the data that is out there. Because as we said, the supply side data is unable to give you certain data on these um, mobile markets, on these prepaid mobile markets in particular. Um, so this really is the only way you can get this data and you can, um, you know, you can challenge or you can check the supply side data. And you know, this is something that GSMA now over the last few years has acknowledged itself. That it's the, the, the SIM sold is not a unique subscriber, and that's why we're getting these percentages, you know, that are being quoted e by, by governments that are coming from, from the mobile operators that are still quoting SIM sold. And even the um, um, UN statistics are still, you know, using those figures. So it's really only through the qualification of the demand side data that you can get the actual figures. And of course, the after access challenges, which are not picked up in the other data at all. I just want to add one very quick thing. I, we think in our region, census is way too infrequent. It's every 10 years. The mobile and internet market is like fast-moving consumer goods. So every two years, there's often labor force surveys uh, and income expenditure surveys that are done by almost all the central banks or some agency. And our recommendation has been that you put in some questions into those. Great. Okay. One, Henriette, one more question. Um, well, it's more discussant input, if that's okay, but if you want to take, I can reserve my responses if you want to take more questions from the rest of the participants. Well, you know what, I, th I think it's fine if it, if it, follows, if okay. it uh, follows from what they're talking about. Um, so I wanted to just um, reiterate uh, what, what has been said about the value of this data. So um, I'm, um, as, as Matt introduced me, I'm um, from the Association for Progressive Communications. And we work in both ICT for development, we're a global network of civil society organizations around the use of ICTs and the internet for social justice and development. So we do ICT for development work and we do human rights work. And for us, this data is just indispensable. And I'll use one example, Rwanda. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed how Rwanda scored it scored low on internet usage. We know it's a very large, uh, largely a rural um, population. It scored even lower on social media usage. Now, Rwanda is considered one of the big su successes when it comes to ICT for development. Um, donors are very attracted to investing in, in Rwanda, and Rwandan government is very successful at convincing donors, even donors from pro-human rights countries, um, to invest in Rwanda. And 
there's general acknowledgement that Rwanda doesn't have a very open media and freedom of information or expression environment that's usually excused on the basis of the fact that Rwanda is doing so well in terms of economic and social development. Um, so this is a very interesting example. And if you look at the Alliance for Affordable Internet Index and you compare Rwanda and South Africa, South Africa actually scores one step down from Rwanda on affordability, but South Africa scores very well relatively. Now, of course, they, there's a huge uh, um, income level difference and there's a, a huge rural urban distribution difference. And it's these differences that we need to, to, to be able to see, to understand, to make sure that our advocacy efforts, plus our investment in, in, in uh, dealing with certain gaps, like the gender gap in access, actually makes sense. So um, I just think it's, it's really, really indispensable. Um, and that's coming from those angles, but I think there are other areas as well, such as um, if you are working in ICTs and education, and you want your projects to have impact beyond the pilot, the localized pilot, you really need this type of data um, in order to design your initiatives, design your effort, um, so that it makes sense, that it reaches the right people, and also then to be able to learn. And that's my final point. Um, um, we are part of, a, 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 along with Research ICT, Africa and Learn Asia, of an initiative of UNESCO called Internet Universality Indicators. It's an effort to measure uh, internet access from the point of view of rights, openness, accessibility, and the multi-stakeholder process. Um, and we can come up with, with an indicators framework, but if there's no data that actually addresses some of the questions that we are asking around content creation, for example, um, around how people are using the internet, we're not really going to be able to get data that allows us to, to learn um, around what's happening to the internet. So really, I want to commend you for this, and I just, uh, I hope it's continuing. I think it's good to get the questions into the census, but I think Ilani's point, that, that it's not <laughs> frequent enough. So yes, I, I just hope that you can cover more countries. That's, that's what I, I, I would like. And uh, what the plans are, if you can tell us what the plans are for that. Okay, so we have one more question, then I'm going to turn to another discussant. Uh, yes, Tuber Fredriksson from Ankara. Sorry I was late to this session. Uh, uh, just uh, on this question about how to capture the data, uh, and through censuses, labor for service, and so on and so forth, it's always uh, people centered, then, in, in a sense. So it's important that I think complement that also with the enterprises, for instance, because they provide data that the people cannot. Uh, and I think for many governments, this uh, this whole area is of, of growing uh, importance. The the other thing I I think we need to also strengthen the not just the the bilateral support here to countries, but we need to bring countries together also uh, uh, in in the whole statistical challenge when they come to measuring the digital economy, digital society, uh, and. Um, uh, we have uh, now got the member states to, to, uh, to agree that we should set up in ANCTA the working group on measuring e-commerce and the digital economy for once to bring statistical experts from member states to the dialogue. Because typically the policy makers and the ministries, they want to use the data, but they are not the experts in actually knowing how best to collect them and analyze them. So we need to have that as a complement. I know ITU has its expert groups, but they cover the areas responsible for, the relevant to ITU, and I really will, uh, we have to call on you as expert organizations also to play an active role in this area. And, and we will have to call on donors as well to ha help make sure that countries can actually come here and participate in this kind of meeting. Thank you for that. Um, so let's turn to Scar. Oh, we have another. Oh, okay, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, hi, uh, Ishan from the Internet Governance Project, and uh, my question is that there's this large uh, group in the surveys that which say that they're not interested in using the internet, and uh, is that an awareness issue? And do you see mobile service providers or ISP, private ISPs or mobile service providers in these countries 
targeting those groups to bring them online? Like, is that is there a market incentive for them to do that, or are they trying to better services for the urban population, which is already online and competing among those users? Because one would imagine that there's this huge untapped market for them, and uh, incentives would align in a way for them to you know reach out to these markets. But if like 50% or 60% of the country says that they don't see the internet as useful. Um, uh, why are these more, uh, you know, private or uh, businesses not trying to get those markets? Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is the um, the next stage of the market that you need to, right? I mean, up upsell, obviously, sell more services to the urban people that you've been selling to, and then get the new consumers and grow the pie. Of Clearly, this is, I mean, we see it in the strategy of mobile operators. Uh, just to clarify that I don't know what the internet is among people, like in the whole population, 15 to 65, right? So if you probably go down lower, you'll have higher numbers. We need to be a little bit careful. Um, and I think the financial imperative is clearly there. And if you look at sort of marketing, um, you see that, I mean, sort of this very Facebook-centric advertising, um, price sensitive stuff, you see operators bringing up, so another reason people are not getting in online is I'm afraid of what content my kids, etc. So you see, for example, in Sri Lanka, telecom operators selling a dongle preloaded with sort of age, you know, you can select the age, 16, 14, etc. content um, blocking software already preloaded into the first dongle they get. So I think this is sort of something we very much see um, in the strategies because you have to do this, right? Uh, just to respond to Torbjorn, I think you're absolutely right. The enterprise level data is really important, uh, formal and informal. It's not only important in sort of, you know, understanding what the level of digitization is and e-commerce, et cetera, but really if you have to under, uh, address the challenges of digitization, which is if you look at a job comprised of many tasks, there's a subset of these tasks that are going to be automated and are going to be lost, which is going to be a huge impact on em employment. Uh, and then the nature of the firm will change based on what the tasks that are outsourceable or digitizable are. So understanding this impact at firm level, I think, is really important. Um, thank you for, for these these questions and, and, and input. I just wanted to respond to the point about the internet. Firstly, just from a methodological point of view, um, I mean, we had this question of you know people said they don't know what the internet is, but they're actually using it. So that was sort of one of the challenges. And actually, it, although a big issue was made of it, in fact, from a policy point of view, we've kind of got people online. It doesn't really matter as long as they're using it, what they def they call it as you know, what they call it. And so in our surveys now, it's just like a default. If people have said, no, they don't use the internet, and then they've said Facebook, you know, the tablet just clicks it over, <laughs> and it's all sort of taken care of. I think what's more interesting is the people who say, I, 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 I have no interest, or, you know, it can't do anything for me. And this is a classical question in a sort of survey work. How do you ask people about things that they don't know? Um, and, you know, there are techniques, but they're very time-consuming. So you actually show people various things, or you show them mobile banking, or you show them whatever it is, and then they say, oh, well, I, w I would be interested. Or, but that we don't do because it's, you know, it's so difficult. But just to say that I think generally we do see across all regions, we do see this mopping up, especially the regions where we have these very low levels of, of internet take-up and these high levels of unawareness or of, of no interest. We do have extensive um, strategies by operators, um, particular products and things have been mentioned here. But I think if you look at the um, GSMA Connected Women study, it's you know tacitly, not even tacitly, it's overtly indicated that by you know um, getting women online, they're going to um, address problems of saturation in, in their markets because these are the pe people who are. Um, you know, are largely the people who are unaware or can't afford the services, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the other thing that this survey work tells us, which is a much bigger policy challenge, is that even when you've addressed your nice branding, low product, clever um, sort of issues, you're still dealing with fundamental issues. The fundamental challenge for us is a human development challenge, is that people are not coming online, not able to use these services optimally because of the you know, social and economic inequalities that exist there. And so that, and I think you see that in, you know, um, the Rwanda data, for example, that was referred to. So you can make all these high level infrastructural supply side issues, but unless you address the fundamental issues of inequality, we, 
people are not, there's not going to be any digital e equality. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left and I want to make sure we get to our last two discussions. So I'm going to turn to Scarlett from Moncton. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to try and be very quick. I'm here representing not only ANCA, but also a little bit the partnership on measuring ICT for development, which uh, some of you might or uh, might be aware of. Um, we are going to present progress on ICT statistics in the next UN Statistical Commission in 2018. Um, and in particular, we're going to talk about um, how the global indicators framework for uh, sustainable development goals um, has 232 indicators, but only seven ICT indicators are included. And this is despite the fact that ICTs are recognized as a key development enabler and have a role to play in achieving these SDGs. And I think this goes back to what Alison just mentioned, the fact that uh, there is, um, that we, we have to be able to use this information to gauge the level of different levels of development, both social and economic. And uh, it's important that all areas where ICTs will play a role are measured and monitored beyond what is currently in this, uh, in this uh, monitoring framework. And with this in mind, the partnership on measuring ICT for development established in June 2017 a task group on ICT for SDGs, which will aim to propose a thematic list of ICT indicators that countries could use to measure ICT availability and use in sectors that are relevant to the SDGs and that are not covered in the current um, SDG indicators framework. And these might include indicators on skills, e-commerce, financial inclusion, e-government, e-waste. Um, and we will also aim at improving the availability of disaggregated indicators. And, uh, and disaggregation would mean uh, by gender, by income level, by uh, geographical um, uh, measurement. And uh, finally, this task group is open to all members of the partnership, which are mostly international organizations, but also other interested agencies and stakeholders, such as IDRC and, and, and uh, Learn Asia. So I take off my hat from the Partnership on Measuring ICT for Development, and I put on my UNCTAD hat. As you know, um, UNCTAD is the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Our focus is really on the economic aspect of things. And the Information Economy Report 2017, this one, um, focuses on digitalization, which was um, uh, mentioned now uh, by Helani. And the second chapter of this report focuses in particular on the issue of measurement. And the rationale behind the report is that we are at a turning point in the global economy that has been enabled by technology. Um, we have emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, which all of us are aware of because the IGF is for the ICT community, but not necessarily the policy people are aware of these, um, of these implications. And, um, well, the statements on the transformative and disruptive uh, potential of ICTs might appear to be self-evident, the IER points out that we ignore more than we actually know about the evolving digital economy and fundamental indicators that are still not widely available for developing countries are the extent to which enterprises have affordable access to relevant ICTs and digital solutions and whether they make productive use of them. And uh, we also know that while ICT uptake is improving, there are wide gaps in the, in the ability of businesses and individuals to make effective use of them. And in least developed countries, women and micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises are all less likely to benefit from the digital economy. And um, we also know that while ICTs can help businesses become more efficient and better connected, and uh, research has shown its potential impact in increased productivity, um, and there is relatively good data on the use of technology by enterprises from developed countries and emerging economies, very few low-income countries measure the use of ICT by enterprises. And where data is available, we always see that a lower proportion of small enterprises make use of the internet than large companies, engage in less complex tax, um, uh, tasks online, etc. 
Um, so what do we need to, um, to know? Um, we need to know more about not only the way that um, enterprises use technology, we also need to know um, about the impact of technology in the labor market. Uh, we have um, ILO global statistics on employment by industry, but data availability is limited even for some large economies. We also will need to measure the availability of ICT skills and, not, uh, and of non-cognitive skills, the enrollment in ICT programs in vocational and higher education, in lifelong training. Um, and this, in addition, this kind of data will help countries match the supply of and demand for digital skills by helping forecast their digital skills need. Um, we need ways to measure new jobs and occupations, the skills they require, and how the workforce is made up. So in conclusion, the measurement challenge of the digital economy cannot be separated from the policy challenge. In order to ensure that um, everybody can benefit from the digital economy, it's essential to produce policy relevant data and statistics on the multiple aspects of the digital divide. Um, we can estimate the size and certain trade aspects of the digital economy, but we cannot measure how ICT used by the public sector or the health sector or in education has indirect impacts on the productivity of enterprises or on social well-being. So the lack of data from developing countries means that the implications of the evolving digital economy for these countries generally are not well researched. And this is why we find this um, very uh, ground level research from, from you guys really, really uh, enriching and um, illuminating. So. Finally, uh, with regards to the work done, being done at the policy level, our level, uh, in terms of measurement of the digital economy, I would just like to let you know that after uh, we published this, we had an, um, an intergovernmental expert group on e-commerce and the digital economy that decided to form a working group to measure, these, um, to, to measure the e-commerce and digital economy. We hope to be able to um, announce this, uh, the terms of reference of this working group officially in the coming months, but we already take the opportunity to invite all of you to express an interest if you would like to contribute to the work of this working group. Um, so that's, uh, and, and if I may, I would like to invite all of you to the e-commerce week next year, 16 to 20 April 2018, because it's a gathering that will allow you to look specifically at digital economy issues and e-commerce, and will bring stakeholders from both ICT community and the policy um, side. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, Scarlett. Can you take a question? Sure, please. Sorry, quick one. It's actually a, f a factual point. Um, I just wanted to say we've only focused on our um, household and individual survey data, but alongside this data are informal sector surveys. So, although we are sort of contributing now by the micro work um, demand side questions that are in the household and individual and um, informal sector surveys. Um, in fact, mainly in the household and individual surveys, there is an informal sector survey which gives us you know, enormous insights into vast parts of the economy in most of the areas that we work in. So small contribution in the formal digital economy, but this very important informal sector survey that provides us some of the informal um, digital economy activity. Okay, in some of the few minutes we have left, I'd like to turn to Adil um, to give his thoughts about the role, and we've talked a lot about the role of this data for policy, for evidence-based policy formulation. I'd be curious as to your perspective uh, from within the African Union Commission. Yeah, l l let's get practical. So, so in the African Union Commission, I think we, in partnership with the European, uh, European Union Commission, we are in the process of uh, implementing a program called PRIDA, which is Policy and Regulation Initiative for Digital Africa. And this is going to be a plat digital platform that has, uh, it will, will be a one-stop shop for all national policy. It will also be uh, all the regulation at the national level. You have it there. And also harmonization tool for all the national policies as well as the uh, monitoring of the implementation of policies and regulation uh, at the national level. So what is important for me uh, to attend this session is in attending this session, I want to 
to see how we can leverage your expertise because this is all the common fact, the common thing in this, for this tool to work, we need to have data and statistics on this platform. So that's why we are interested uh, in attending the session, just to make sure that it can leverage your expertise so that we have this platform, not only in the uh, research-based policy making, also on the implementation of our policy and to see how are we going in the right direction or going in the wrong direction and so forth. So, so this is something that is of value for us. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Sarah, let's open it up. Uh, thank you for the floor. I, I think I just want to bring up some quick reflections or maybe questions and see how they link up to this overall discussion. I think what I've been taking on, uh, I'm Ninja from the World Foundation, by the way. I'm taken by this uh, narrative that is predominant in the Global South about mobile first and to some extent mobile only. And I wonder at what point we start reflecting on the limitations of that approach to meaningful work and even to the perceptions of relevance uh, of the internet. Because if those are the approaches that we're seeing being uh, especially reflected in policy, much less so in research, because research will follow what's there, is how much meaningful work can anybody do on their mobile phone? When's the last time you wrote a report on your mobile phone and that kind of thing? So that even when you're reflecting on e-commerce, what we're looking at here is a very big risk of people in these parts of the world being consumers and never necessarily the creators and undermining the whole idea of the economies we want to unleash with digital, um, uh, you know, digital Africa, Asia, Latin America, whatever you want to call it. So I wonder where, at which point, with the African Union, with UNCTAD and other bodies, you start reflecting on the limitations of this idea of mobile first or mobile only and how we start challenging it. Uh, because it's, it's also going to, uh, sh I guess, short changes down the line. And then just to um, the point about the policy and regulation initiative for digital Africa, I think that's a great initiative. Uh, speaking mostly as an African first here and as a citizen and somebody who's worked with innovators, I think at whatever point you invite expertise, it will be fundamental to speak to the people who are users of these platforms from innovations, from uh, even representatives of young groups that are always often not represented, that to be involved in those discussions and not lock them out. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, one more statement, and then I think we're going to have to wrap up as we are running out of time. Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, welcome this initiative between the EU and the African Union. I would just here uh, encourage you to participate in the next intergovernmental group of experts on e-commerce and the digital economy and make exactly this point so that all policymakers see that this is really a priority for governments of Africa, that it's very hard to formulate good policies in this area if you don't know the lay of the land. Uh, and uh, if we can support you in that context, uh, we'll be very happy to. Uh, I think uh, in many, many cases when we talk about what kind of efforts we can do to help digital development in, in developing countries, the statistical aspect is often forgotten. Uh, it's not sexy. But once you have the data, everyone is really happy about it. But it really <laughs> takes an effort to well, get those data. Everyone. No, maybe not everyone, but uh, at least you can have a debate <laughs> on it. The, other, the final thing I want to say is also, uh, after Scarlett's intervention about the, the indicators, indicators are fantastic, but they can also be a bit dangerous. Because once you have the uh, indicators that are adopted on the basis of data availability, we will look at those areas where we have data availability. And if we want to really leverage ICT for development, we need to have more than just connectivity data, even though it's fundamental. But otherwise, the, the, we will continue to focus just on improving the ICT supply side and forgetting about the demand side, because it's harder to get the data on the demand side. OK. OK, we, uh, the discussion wants to continue. So I'm going to let that happen. The, the patient gentleman in the front, please. Thank you. I'm Deepak, um, IEEE Internet Initiative, the incoming chair, and uh, I come from India. So four quick points. Number one, I fully agree that uh, mobile first might be a good uh, strategy, but mobile first and foremost might be a challenge. Mm. So that's one area. And there, yes, uh, people should be seen not only as consumers, but as uh, rather prosumers, something which Alvin Toffler had mentioned way back in early 70s that in future people will be producing as well as consuming. Second thing in terms of, uh, you mentioned in terms of UNCTAD, the 
uh, impact of small scale SMEs, small and medium enterprises. Now, in some cases, the government policy, even if it is for a totally different reason, can actually incentivize in a totally different manner. So, for example, in India, we rolled out uh, the unified goods and service tax from 1st of July this year. And the only way to file tax returns is online. So, willy-nilly, people will have to come online in some manner. Okay. So, it's a forced thing, but it's there. Third thing is uh, that uh, you mentioned about women uh, at times being having this challenge of uh, getting access. That's right. But at the same time, there are also cases where women are finding additional opportunities because of ICT. So, for example, handicrafts and other type of things. So, they can do those things if, for which otherwise they had social challenges in terms of stepping out and trying to sell those things outside or uh, collaborating on that thing. The last thing is about measurement. On the measurements, I think we need to differentiate between four different concepts very clearly. One is there's a number of subscriptions, which is just the number of connections, the legal contracts. So if I have three different mobile phones and one, mo one fixed line connection, I have four subscriptions, but I'm a still a single subscriber. So there's a difference between subscriber and subscription. Oftentimes we conflate these. Third is the users. If you have a single connection in a school, there could be hundreds of children who might be using that. So the number of users need not be equivalent to the number of connections or the number of customers. So in the mobile industry, people often use this phrase called ARPU, average revenue per user per month, uh, but actually it is a ARPS, which is average revenue per subscription, not even per subscriber. The last is that we also need to look at that there are people who are even not users, but still internet touches them. So for example, in India, when my house help goes to her village and wants to travel by train, instead of taking a day off, she asks us to make the booking, we make the booking online, and she travels on that ticket. So she knows that there's a way to do those things. She doesn't know how to use it herself, or her family does not know, but they nevertheless get benefit of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I know we have a uh, few people, but uh, can I encourage you to be yeah, brief? Extremely short, I know, sorry, Matt. It's, okay. uh, it's, it's an opportunity for research like this. Uh, Argentina has assumed the presidency of the G20, in, and inside the G20 is something called the Digital Economy Task Force. And during 2018, digital inclusion, along with the future of work and skills, are gonna be two tracks and two you know, focus for that digital economy. So data and research and how you know, developing and developed countries can start, you know, building a strategy about digital inclusion. It's an opportunity for, for you, basically. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this has been a small but, uh, but passionate group. I think we all are excited that we have the data now. Um, and it will be coming out uh, over the next, I don't know, few months. Yes. And be made openly available as well. I think I'll let uh, Allison, would you like to say any words to wrap up? I'll just say a few words and then I'm sure um, Helani and Ali might have something, but I'll try and, I'll try and be quick because I know we're over. Um, I did want to say that what we've shown you here is just really our very first high-level findings. This is descriptive data, and I wanted to reiterate the point that uh, Torvald made about um, sort of what descriptive data can mask. And that's really what we go into now into this next phase where we start modeling this data and we can get some sort of meaningful understanding. And often, you know, particularly in relation to gender, into a lot of relation to a lot of other things, the descriptive data masks the sort of factors of, of what we're seeing, what's causing the inequalities that we're seeing. So um, I think I just wanted to make that um, point very quickly. And then also just to say, um, all of us in, uh, across the um, Net Go um, Global South Network um, we have started doing this work. We, we actually, our mandate is, is to influence policy and regulation. And um, we would love for governments to go out and do, collect this, these statistics, and we could simply get the data and analyze it as we want to do and put out the nice, interesting policy work and policy papers. But we know now, after doing this for a decade, on the um, ta Canadian taxpayers' um, you know, buck, that unless we actually mobilize and organize amongst ourselves and among, with, together with multilateral agencies and with our regional associations and, and, and or multilateral agencies as well, this work is not going to go on. So this is really an appeal for further collaboration. Um, 
this is not the end of our work. Um, as, uh, just to, to respond to Scarlett's work, I think Scarlett's very familiar with the work we've done around policy and um, regulatory influence, the really significant um, in, um, impacts that we've had on various policy and regulatory processes, um, particularly in the area of pricing. We also collect large amounts of supply side data and we look at the supply and the demand side data together. And perhaps just very broadly from a very high level at this stage, and I know there's slightly different nuances in the different regions, to say that the purpose of this research is also to identify the areas of research that are needed for policymakers going forward. And I think what is a very um, sort of profound point that we've reached with the um, very low in internet penetration rates, but internet penetration rates, which I should say, nevertheless, are only possible because of mobile broadband. We were just, you know, we'd reached our little turn fixed um, and broadband in South Africa and the rest, and North Africa and the rest of the country, there was nothing. Mobile broadband, it's happened with voice, it's happened with broadband, so it's absolutely critical. Whether we have, to, and I think what's clear from our research, and just to, to, to respond to the point that was made, because I think it's an important one, is that um, you know, mobile on its own cannot be everything. And in fact, we know from our research now that it's not, that large numbers of people are buying their little tiny micro package of um, you know, data, going to the public Wi-Fi where it's available extensively in Rwanda, by the way, and in South Africa, downloading these things, doing their video, doing their, some of their e-government because it's available on those services, um, you know, actually meaningfully using them instead of, as you say, <laughs> them sort of all supply side driven, and um, uh, you know, uh, getting onto the net that way. Doing the working in libraries, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to begin to look at the use of the internet outside of this individualized thing. And we did discuss some of the, the measurement issues there before you came in um, to, to address that. But I think it, it raises serious policy questions for us about um, how we are going to address in, in, um, in digital inequality in future and identify research areas as we go forward. Okay, thanks. I think we actually really do have to wrap up now. Um, just to note, as a Canadian taxpayer, I'm, I'm pleased to have been able to support uh, this important and influential work. And thank you to everyone for attending this session and for the patience of going over time. Are you, and then I leave early tomorrow. So um, I think we should be done by about one. Yes, yeah, I should, but I should be done here by about one, two. Can I get, you, I've got your number, don't I? Let me just get it again quickly here. Yeah, we'll be putting on the list, but we won't show our list. Yeah.